Alright you guys, got another video here for you on simple steps to secure your NAS. So assuming that you've got your NAS now all set up, you've plugged everything in, you've got your drives in and you've set up your storage pool and your volume, everything is working as is. Now we need to secure the NAS itself and that's what we're going to be doing. So the first thing you should be doing is going to the security advisor here and running a scan on your system. This will scan to make sure that everything is been done to uh, the security level that Synology or QNAP or Acetor or TerraMaster or any of them other uh, NASs want you to do. Most of them will have this feature in here and you'll see there's green ticks here, which means everything is up to date and everything's done correctly. Uh, you've got these to cover malware, system, account, network and update. You want to make sure these are all green ticked if there's any red crosses here you will need to make sure that these have all been fixed and rectified as you can see here now before we continue i just want to have a quick word from today's video sponsor cd key sales if you're looking for a cheap windows 10 pro or cheap windows 11 pro oem key then check out the links in the video description head over to cd key sales and create yourself an account and then use my promo code capital b capital r 09 and apply this to your order. This will give you a 30% discount on all your purchases on CD Key Sales. You can use PayPal to pay for your order and then they will send you your key and you can activate your version of Windows. It's as easy as that. So the first thing you want to do is go to users and groups. Now normally by default you will see a system default user here. I've disabled my one and I've also deactivated it right here. And it's important that you do this because all NAS manufacturers will uh, tell you to disable the uh, system default user and create your own user. So how do you create your own user? All you need to do is hit the create button, create a new user, and then put your name, description, email, and passwords inside here. And you can send a notification mail to your newly created account if you want to and set that up. Once that's all done, you should have something looking like this. If you see a guest account here, I've disabled this and deactivated this also. And I've also just got one account here. Next, click on the account and then go to advanced. This is where you can apply your password strength rules for the account. You can see I've got this set to exclude name and description of the user for the password. So you can't use any of the username in the password. Also, we've got include mixed case, include numeric uh, characters, include special characters, exclude common passwords, and minimum password length is 11, which I've set it to, which is pretty much the industry standard. That means it has to be a minimum of 11 characters, and it has to have all of these in it to make it nice and strong. And that way, you'll make sure that no one can guess your password. Next up, we're going to go down to the password expiration date here. So you can click on this, and basically what this will do is this will set a maximum password valid duration. And normally 30 days is about the norm for most people. They will try and force you to change the password every 30 days. If you don't want to do this, then don't. But you should be doing it for security reasons because most people will keep passwords for many, many months, even years. And that is not a good security practice. You want to make sure that you are changing this every 30 days. You can see here we've got the minimum password uh, uh, valid duration day and also you can prompt users to change their passwords upon login before the expiration date here as well and you can even send it to a notification email if you want to you would have to set this feature up if you wanted to do that down here you can see users for home and this is all set up already so we're going to leave that as is if you don't want to set it up you can just remove the check mark Next, we're going to head over to the security tab here. And inside the security tab, we'll just go quickly to the firewall here. Make sure your firewall is enabled and configured. You can go through here and enable this. And you can see the profile is set to default here. Uh, if you go to edit rules here, you're going to see a bunch of rules that you can create. This is quite a, an in-depth topic here. But again, you can create a rule and you can then set this up as uh, select from list of built-in applications and if you need to allow ports open and allow things to go in and out you can set this up on your firewall 
section here and you can see a uh, specific IP and location and so on. Uh, and if you want to set these up for SSH and things like that, you can do. Uh, but this is where you would all set this up if you want to set up your firewall uh, rules here. And that's out the scope of this video to set all this up here. And let's move on to the protection tab here. This is another important area. Login attempts, I've got this enabled, auto block, and we've got login attempts five within minutes five. So you can see how I've set this up myself. You can set this up how you like. But basically what this means is when they attempt to log in or you attempt to log in, you would have five attempts. And uh, within five minutes, you would have five attempts. If you fail, you will be locked out. And that will be even for yourself. If you keep forgetting, it will lock you out. This is a very important uh, step because obviously if someone is trying to probe and get into your system, they will be timed out and they won't be able to do anything. So we don't want to enable block exploration here. We don't want to do that because this will unblock them within so many days and you don't want to unblock them. You want to leave them blocked. But what you can do here is go down to the allow and block list. And right here on the block list section, you will see all of the blocked IPs here listed. These will be all the IPs that have been trying to gain access to your NAS. You can see there's no one been trying to gain access to mine. And also, I have not had any failed login attempts. They will be listed right here. OK, and you can clear these if they're your own uh, or you can uh, leave them where they are. Next up, we've got the denial of service. You want to make sure you enable the denial of service protection. This stops people from trying to uh, prevent uh, malicious attacks over the Internet to deny you access to your NAS. Now, there is a section here under the advanced area here which says enable spectra and meltdown protection. I have this on checkmarked, but you can read the information here on the security advisor and it will tell you whether you want to enable this or not. And you can choose what you want to do here regarding this uh, feature. Now under the security tab here, you can see here we've got a bunch of different settings we can uh, take here. Clear all saved user login sessions upon uh, system restart. And you can see here set up browser automatic logout time for DSM, including the web uh, applications. And you can set this up as well here uh, for your liking. And you also here, you can see allow users on web browsers to skip two-factor uh, two authentication by trusted uh, devices. Next to this tab, you will see two-factor authentication. This is another feature that you should enable but you will need to set up the email notification service uh, to be notified every time. And uh, this is a very good security measure to have in place. You can do it for all users or just administrator groups as well, depending, or you can just do it for a you know, specific type of user or group of people. And you can set this up right here. And down here, you'll have the enable account protection here for untrusted clients and also for trusted clients right down here and you can set this up how you like here you can see my settings I've got set here next up we're going to go to the terminal and SMMP and this one I've taken out the check mark here for enable SSH service now some people like to leave this on all the time because they want to gain access via SSH to their NAS and you can do if you want to I find that a little bit of a security risk to leave it on all the time so I just take this uh, check mark out when I'm not using it. And if I want to use it uh, for a period of time, I will just put the check mark back in. And again, you can set this up how you like. Uh, but I've got mine turned off here. But if you're one of those people that use the terminal quite a lot and you're accessing it via the SSH method, then or by a terminal here, you can do uh, and have this set up in the advanced settings here. But I leave this off. Under the network section here on the left hand pane, you can go to connectivity and you can also enable your HTTP uh, 2 here forward slash 2. This is for your HTTPS settings here. You will need to configure all of this, but if you can set this up and it will set up your HTTPS. And this is uh, supplied uh, by Synology themselves on this particular unit. But to set this up, you will need to go into your router and basically set up your uh, port forwarding uh, to allow these uh, certain ports to go through so you can have HTTPS. I'm not going to go through all of this in this video, uh, but if you want to see a video on that, let me know in the comments section below.
Next up, we're going to go down to the update and restore. And in this area, you can see your DSM version is up to date. Make sure you're using the very latest version uh, to make sure that you are nice and secure and all the patches and bugs have been fixed. Also, go into your update settings here. It's important that you can see we've got this set to automatically install important updates that fixed critical security issues and also bugs. This is recommended. So you can automatically install the latest update here. But I'm going to leave this as is here and you can set this up here down here for check uh, schedule as well if you want to set this up. But I'm going to leave this on automatically install. Now we're just going to nip down to the hardware and power here. And again, not everyone's going to have a UPS here, but if you do have a UPS, this is where you're going to configure it and you can enable UPS support right here. And this will allow you to, uh, you know, basically keep power to your NAS to make sure it doesn't uh, just turn off if you have a power cut. If you're having frequent power cuts, then having a UPS is essential. And uh, these are not very expensive. You can purchase these on Amazon and uh, you can get this set up. If you want to see a video on this, let me know. I do have a UPS uh, to hand to show you how to set it up. It is very simple to do, but let me know in the uh, comments section. Okay, let's jump over to hard drive hibernation. You can see I've got it uh, enabled on here. And basically what that's going to do is the initial hard drives will go to sleep after 20 minutes. So if you're not using your NAS all the time and you're not using it for many, many hours at any one time, it will go into sleep mode just like you would with your PC. But if you are access accessing it all the time, then obviously hibernation mode uh, is useless to you because you're going to be constantly accessing your uh, NAS. But if you're one of these people that just access it every so often, and that means Plex and any other application that is running on the uh, NAS itself, uh, if you started Plex up and you had it in hibernation mode, all the lights will go out. Hard drives will uh, turn off. And again, once you access Plex and try to play a movie, it will fire up and it will take a little bit of time uh, to uh, populate again. And once it does, you will start getting the activity back on your NAS again. Some people turn this off and say because it does add wear and tear to the drives. I don't know about that myself, but I just have it set like this. Let's just quickly talk about the uh, fan speed right here. You can see full speed mode is right here. And depending on how you like your set, if it's in the winter, you can have this set to cool mode or uh, or quiet mode, depending on uh, what how hot your room is and how many drives you got in there and how hard you work your NAS. Again, full speed mode would be obviously the fans spinning at full speed and that can uh, get a bit noisy. I have mine set to cool mode. And if you're in your bedroom or something like that and you want to turn down the LED lights on it, you can just dim these down a little bit by just turning this down and then that will be a lot less bright uh, because they do get a bit bright once you have all of the drives populated. And if you've got a large uh, a NAS with a load of drives in it, these LED lights can sort of keep flickering uh, on there and it can uh, light up the room quite a bit. Anyway, I think that's about it. Just make sure your drives are running okay. You can always check your drives uh, inside here. You can run a check, make sure they're all healthy. And you can also uh, do some uh, maintenance inside here as well. You will also see here uh, data scrubbing. You can run this. You can see it's not been run yet. So I can run this now. And uh, this has been uh, going for a while. So I'll leave this right here. And we can pause the data scrubbing and uh, this will be going on for some time. So I'll just leave this running in the background. And I think that's going to be about it for this video. So anyway, I think that's going to be about it. My name has been Brian from brightechcomputers.co.uk. Just want to say a quick shout out to all my YouTube members who join my YouTube members group. I really do appreciate the support and I shall catch you in the very next video or I'll see you on the Discord server for a chat. Have a lovely weekend and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.